Welcome to our monthly webinar series hosted by the Office of Integrated Healthcare Research and Policy in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Let me begin by telling you a bit about our sponsor and partners. This webinar series is sponsored by the California Mental Health Services Authority Integrated Behavioral Health Project. CalMesa is an organization of county governments working to improve mental health outcomes for individuals, families, and communities. Early prevention and early intervention programs implemented by CalMesa are funded by counties through the voter approved Proposition 63, the Mental Health Services Act. Prop 63 provides the funding and framework needed to expand mental health services to previously underserved populations in all of California's diverse communities. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Academy for Integrating Behavioral Health and Primary Care functions as a coordinating center and national resource for people committed to delivering comprehensive integrated health care. The Academy focuses particularly on integrating behavioral health into primary care practices and promotes a collaborative environment that fosters dialogue among leaders and other stakeholders. Key Academy tasks include the National Integration Academy Council, an expert panel of nationally recognized leaders in integrated health care, the Academy web portal and literature repository, and the recently developed Lexicon for Behavioral Health and Primary Care Integration. The Collaborative Family Healthcare Association is a nonprofit, member driven collaborative organization in existence since 1995. CFHA promotes a comprehensive and cost effective model of healthcare delivery that integrates mind and body, individuals and families, patient providers, and communities. Advancing Care Together, a project at University of Colorado Denver Department of Family Medicine, is a four year program aimed to discover practical models to integrate mental health, substance use, and primary care services. The program, funded by the Colorado Health Foundation, has funded 11 demonstration projects that have been organized as a set of diverse comparative case studies and will be linked to support cross-project learning. Before introducing our presenter today, I'm going to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. So to the right of your computer screen is the GoToWebinar control panel, where you can listen through either your telephone or your computer mic and speakers. If you're um, logging on with your telephone, there's the phone number at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. And at the end of our presentation today, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And so throughout the presentation, you can submit your questions through the chat feature in the GoToWebinar control panel. Or at the end, you can raise your um, little hand icon and I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Carrie. So today we are pleased to bring you Carrie Sparling. Carrie has been living with type 1 diabetes for over 27 years, diagnosed in 1986. She manages her diabetes and lives her life by the mantra, diabetes doesn't define me, but helps explain me. Carrie is a passionate advocate for all things diabetes. She is the creator and author of Six Until Me, one of the first and most widely read diabetes patient blogs, reaching a global audience of patients, caregivers, and the industry. Outside of her blog, her work can be found in a variety of resources, such as Diatribe and the Diabetes Outreach, like JDRF's Countdown Magazine, in addition to her extensive diabetes YouTube channel. She's well-versed in social media and its influence on patients, and regularly presents at conferences and works full-time as a writer and consultant. Her first book, titled Balancing Diabetes, was released in the spring of 2014. Carrie lives in Rhode Island with her husband and daughter and can be reached on Twitter at 6 Until Me. Today, Carrie will discuss how patients are turning to peer to peer support for assistance in managing their physical and emotional well beings. Welcome, Carrie, and I'm going to pass um, the control over to you. Okay, so am I good to uh, shrink down my camera and put my slides up? Yes, you are. Thank you. All right. So I'll see you at the end physically, okay. but I'll be here the whole time. Okay. So are we good? Can you see those slides? Yep. And you can't see me? Can't see you. Perfect. Then we are ready to go. So kind of skip past the opening slide and just run right into, um, into this. So my name is Carrie Sparling. And like you said, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes back in 1986 just before starting second grade. So I've been living with type 1 diabetes for 27 years. And this photo here is 
the before photo, and I like using this photo because it might be the only one in existence of me flanked by two birthday cakes. So my mom doesn't really approve that I use this photo in the slides because so many people have mistakenly asked her if I have diabetes because she gave me too much sugar as a kid. And it's hard to have that no type 1 diabetes is autoimmune and the cause remains unknown conversation with a bunch of strangers. So these two cakes were not the catalyst of my diagnosis, but they do serve to show what I looked like before my diabetes. And then this is a photo of me the year that I was uh, diagnosed. I was diagnosed in second grade, I was seven years old, and upon diagnosis I spent two weeks in the hospital learning how to inject myself with insulin and checking my blood sugar using a Lansing device. So the certified diabetes educator pictured here in this photo was the first one I had and she immediately leapt onto the uh, whole person sort of health bandwagon because she allowed me to check the blood sugar of my stuffed animal dog to help me feel less alone with this new diagnosis. And so this, um, this nurse worked at the Jocelyn Diabetes Clinic in Boston, and it was here that I really learned about type 1 diabetes, and I learned to practice to inject injections onto oranges. And so the nurses at the time said that the oranges were most like human skin, and they helped simulate the tension and the pop that the needle of the syringe made when it pushed through my skin. And I was fine, completely fine, with injecting those oranges, pushing the needle into my own skin. It was a whole different story. But this photo just serves to illustrate that the kid before diagnosis and the kid after diagnosis really look the same, that type 1 diabetes was a hard thing to look at the, the child and say, oh, well, something must be wrong. You must be, quote unquote, sick. I looked exactly the same. So the first tools of my diabetes management were admittedly remedial. I wasn't sent home with a glucose meter. Uh, my mom actually confessed this to me recently. We were sent home with a urinalysis kit that looks similar to this one, even though at-home glucose meters were available. Uh, my mom told me that emotionally she wasn't ready for that kind of data yet. She wasn't ready to see blood sugar numbers because she actually didn't know what to do with them. So that psychosocial journey of life with type 1 diabetes wasn't just limited to my reaction to it, but it was expanded to the reactions of my caregivers and the people you know, who were intrinsically in my life. So we spent a month using the urine testing kit while we adjusted to this new normal of my type 1 diabetes diagnosis. It was kind of a gross endeavor, like going into the bathroom to provide a urine sample, and then you had to pour it into the test tubes and drop what looked like pause egg coloring kit uh, sort of tablets into the urine to instigate a color change. And if the color turned blue and the tube stayed cool, basically meant that I could have a snack and that my mom's you know, face wouldn't get worried because that meant that my blood sugar was reasonably in control. If the tube instead turned hot, and switched to be a bright orange color, I knew I'd be getting another injection. <laughs> the system was admittedly horrible. The urine spilled into my, the sugar spilled into my urine was sometimes four hours behind the level in my blood. So it made dosing something as, as serious and, and um, uh, integral to my life with diabetes, made dosing that insulin difficult because we were dosing off of information that might have been stale. So after a month of this system, my mom was ready for more information. We we're emotionally ready to move on uh, with the data that we had. So we requested an at-home blood glucose meter. And this was one of the first ones that I had. It was the size of a brick, and this is literally the size of a brick, not just a phrase used to exaggerate. And it was so cumbersome that it came with its own carrying case, like a giant side purse. My mom would carry her purse and then slug this big maroon bag around with us so that she could check my blood sugar before meals and before bedtime. It took 120 seconds to give the glucose meter result, and it required a large sample of blood. And I realize that saying this makes me sound like a diabetes dinosaur, so I guess now's a good time to mention that I went, I walked uphill both ways to get to the endocrinologist's office. <laughs> and this, this thing was how we procured that large sample of blood. This was the autolet. And I show this slide at diabetes conferences and the audience usually gasps and sucks all the oxygen out of the room because they remember using this device. And it was an awful device. The Lancet, which had a gauge of I don't know what the gauge actually was, but it felt like it was two. And it was loaded into the device, and then you'd cock it back into place, and it would make this loud chunking noise, which we always associated with the pain that was coming next. And then you'd press your finger at that circle at the bottom, and you'd press the top red button to release the Landsat, and it would come rocketing, rocketing towards your finger because it was spring-loaded, and it pierced the top of your finger. In my family, we affectionately referred to this device as the guillotine. And this is how we were drawing blood sugar results and to get that droplet of blood back when I was first diagnosed. And also, I, I used insulin injections to deliver my insulin way back in the day. This was before microfine needles and insulin pens, so my house was filled with the good old-fashioned syringes, and I carried them in a book bag to school. I took insulin that was wrung essentially out of the pancreas of pigs and cows, and it had to be mixed before dosing. And the sound of my insulin bottles clacking against my mother's rings as she rolled the bottles between her hands was truly the soundtrack of my diabetes as a child. My mom did so much to take care of me to assume the role of pancreas, 
And then she helped, to, helped me learn to assume that role as I grew older. And so part of that assumption, kind of taking control, not just of the ins and outs of my diabetes, but the emotional reins of my diabetes, came down to finding access to support, not just by parental support, but from my peers. And so this slide is an example of the first example of peer-to-peer -peer support that I ever had access to as a kid with diabetes. Support way back in the day was as remedial as my diabetes tools, but this was a bright, shining spot of perfection. It was called the Clara Barton Camp for Diabetic Girls at the time, but it's since been renamed the Barton Center. But this was the only place where it was normal for a nurse to roll in a trolley full of syringes and insulin and for all of the campers to shoot up together before breakfast because every single camper was also living with type 1 diabetes. Even the staffers were living with type 1 diabetes. So what I thought was rare and unusual what was going on in my house taking care of my, my disease, this was normal there. And that normal was empowering, being a part of, of adults and kids who truly understood what life with diabetes was like. And it replaced the shame of my mom having to come into the second grade classroom and explain how I was different from my classmates. And this made me feel normal again, like having diabetes was kind of normal, or at least in normal in quotation marks. Camp was, like I said, my first point of access for peer-to-peer -peer support. And this is, it's not just, you know, the warm and fuzzy kumbaya moments, but this is where I learned day-to-day -day management tools for living with diabetes that actually improved my health. health. Health outcomes were improved as a result of attending camp. This is where I learned to rotate my injection sites, straying away from the overused flesh of my arms and legs, and instead pressing that needle against my stomach for the first time. The girls at camp, they were the ones that empowered me to try this new space, this new thing. And the thing that I was scared to try, but I knew I needed to try in order to retain the integrity of my injection sites. This is powerful. And then in keeping with the peer-to-peer -peer support that wasn't just taking place at camp, this, this is me three months after my diagnosis. I'm the one with the little stuffed animal cat and also the one not sitting in front of the birthday cake, but instead in front of an alternate box of sugar-free um, Reese cups. Uh, the sleepover kind of marked the beginning of my family's new life with type 1 diabetes because it represented the first real-world challenge where management and and real life, you know, came together all at once. This was a sleepover and my very first sleepover. My mom was terrified to let me go, but she knew that my independence and my happiness were just as important as my physical health. And this was, was a mantra that I kind of held on to as I aged with diabetes. My mom brought me to my friend's house, introduced herself to my friend's mother, and stayed until it was time for my bedtime shot. And she would give me the injection before driving home. Then the following morning, she was there again, I think at like six in the morning, having coffee with my friend's mom, and then waking me up for my morning injection. I can't imagine how terrifying it was for her to let her kid, newly minted with diabetes, to sleep over at someone's house. And I can't imagine how tired she was coming over to give me my bedtime shot and then that subsequent morning shot. I think my mom was able to function without sleep for whatever reason. But this marked a huge turning point in how diabetes was viewed in my house. It wasn't viewed as something that was going to hold me back, but was instead viewed as something that we would use to push me forward. And so as the years went on, diabetes treatment options progressed, you know, just like everything else. The analog insulins were introduced in the late 90s, and they came to life in my bloodstream after 20 minutes instead of that hour wait time. So physiologically, this was fantastic because my blood sugars didn't have a chance to spike at the same level as they did before when I was on regular insulin. But psychosocially, this changed the way that I ate because instead of timing my meals to my injections, I was able to time my injections to my meals, and this gave me freedom. I could eat with my peers, with my family, instead of feeling like I was always chasing the tail of my insulin. I also went on an insulin pump uh, back in 2004, swapping out what became nine injections a day instead for changing an infusion set that's placed subcutaneously in my skin. And that's changed every three days. And despite wearing a medical advice that was truly the first external symptom of my diabetes, pumping insulin was also freeing. I could sleep in without the fear of missing an injection. I could take my insulin while out to dinner without pulling out a syringe at the table. Admittedly, this device was an emotional hurdle to overcome, adding in a medical device to you know, what you wear every single day, but the health outcome was truly worth it. And then this thing came into my life in 2006. This is called a continuous glucose monitor, and this model is called a Dexcom. And it includes a transmitter that's in inserted under my skin, and it pulls interstitial fluid blood glucose results, and then sends those results to that external receiver that's black. So essentially, I have access to my blood sugar trends every five minutes instead of just seeing the results on my glucose meter every hours after pricking my finger. And this device has revolutionized the way I care for my diabetes because not only is it giving me the data that I need to make educated decisions, but it's also putting a safety net underneath everyday actions. It alarms when my blood sugars go above or below certain thresholds, prompting me to take action on those, on those numbers. And it might sound like it's, like I said, very data-driven and, and 
you know, very clinical. But this device allows me to go to sleep at night without worrying about what's going to happen to my blood sugars and to me on the overnight. So the continuous glucose monitor doesn't replace the regular glucose meter, which is why I still test my blood sugar, you know, with a finger prick regularly throughout the day. But even the glucose meters are a far cry from that one that my mom was carrying in a giant bag around her shoulder when I was a child. This one looks so simple and so modern that a girl I was sitting next to on a plane thought it was an iPod. And I'm sure you can imagine her shock when, you know, throughout the flight, I was repeatedly <laughs> bleeding onto my iPod. But like with diabetes, touches outside of things like lab work and insulin injections and glucose meters and all of that hardware. It's not simply about the technology and the drugs I'm using to attempt to manage this condition. This disease is truly as psychological as it is physical. So this slide shows a to-do list that I made after a pretty serious argument with my parents about diabetes. Um, I was nine years old and it was a list of things that I needed to do if I wanted to stay alive. So as you can see, it says to test and that means to test my blood sugar. No cheating means to stick with the diet that my mother had prescribed to me and the doctors had prescribed you know, to help maintain my blood sugars in as level as we could. Shoot like mom tells me meant to take the insulin injection as prescribed by my parents. And then the last one kind of kills me because be responsible. I don't know a lot of nine-year-olds who uh, can make that their mantra, make that the thing that they are told to do every day, be responsible. But for kids diagnosed with diabetes, this was something that was not only requested, but, but essential. This was a heavy list of to-dos to carry around, and it acknowledges the burden of self-care and mortality that people with diabetes are carrying every day. Like I said, diabetes is a very emotional condition. And in keeping with that theme, I like the irony of cupcakes up on the slides of a person with diabetes who's presenting. So the food rules that were slapped into place immediately upon diagnosis, it made diabetes feel like a disease of don'ts. Don't eat the cookies, don't forget to measure your food, don't leave the house without your insulin or your glucose meter or your glucose tabs. Don't go to bed without checking your blood sugar. Don't eat too much sugar-free candy. But some of the, do you know, the don'ts were a little more subtle. And they were don'ts like don't allow the disease that's built around obsessing about food to let you become obsessed with food. So kind of to illustrate that, uh, my mother used to hide packages of cookies in her closet. And I'd wait until she was in the shower to steal into her walk-in and grab cookies by the fistful. And I would eat until my stomach ached, and I don't know why. And I also didn't take an injection to cover my, in, my indulgences, and I still don't know why I didn't do that either. One time I bold-faced lied to my mom about eating a package of Hostess cupcakes, even though the evidence was completely obvious. My blood sugar was 385 milligrams per deciliter, far exceeding the range of normal. The cupcake wrapper was in my garbage in my room, and a ring of chocolate circled my mouth, but I still denied eating them, which was a huge source of argument between my mom and I, because it wasn't so much the blood sugar that resulted in this action, but more the fact that I lied about it. And lies like this continued into my adulthood. I have no idea why I never bolus for those furtive snacks. It was almost as if like taking insulin forced me to acknowledge that I shouldn't have eaten it in the first place. As though the bolus itself, that bolus of insulin made the action real instead of the resulting high blood sugar. And for a very, very long time, I thought I was alone with all of these feelings, with all of these fears and lies and concerns. And for a long time, I was. This is the tumbleweed to illustrate the loneliness, right? A little on the nose. But between my summers at camp, at diabetes camp, and my early adulthood, I was the only person with type 1 diabetes that I knew. I had medical support from my healthcare team, and they were instrumental in keeping me alive and keeping me physically healthy, but I did not have access to peer-to-peer -peer support. And that was dragging me down into the emotional doldrums. Really wanted to find these people. Back in 2005, if you put diabetes into Google, you'd get a search return list of reasons why your life was going to be compromised in every way. And when I started my website back in 2005, I was 26 and I didn't want to see those reasons. I was aware of the realities of life with type 1, type 1 diabetes, but my focus was on the life part of diabetes, not just the preposition that hangs off of it, the with diabetes part. I didn't want to hear about the things that were going to go wrong. I wanted to find other people who were living with diabetes, not dying from it. So at the suggestion of my now husband, I decided to start a blog to find those people, to find that community that I was, that I was seeking. And in May of 2005, I started my website. And it's funny how fast the thoughts come to you and the emotions purge themselves when they've been bottled up inside of you for almost two decades. And from that, that moment on, from that first blog post, I found my community where I belonged, where me and my non-functioning pancreas belonged. And I wasn't alone anymore. So the mantra of my website, as, as Emma had mentioned, is diabetes doesn't define me, but it helps explain me. It's the tagline of my blog, and it's kind of the little catchphrase that hangs out in my head while I'm trying to think about living with diabetes. And through my website, I've been able to connect with so many of my peers, and my health outcomes emotionally and physically 
are truly better for those connections. So some of the people that I've had the honor and the pleasure of getting to know over the last 10 years, uh, these are just some of the blogs that are, that are online currently where people are sharing real life with diabetes. And these sites aren't necessarily crammed with medical advice. It's not a how-to, but it's the anecdotal information and the support on these sites that's found that can and has changed health outcomes for people with diabetes. Well, how does it do that? It's because people with diabetes know they aren't alone. The people sharing their stories online have had a tremendous impact on my life as a person with diabetes. I mean, if you go to websites like these, this is Two Diabetes, Children with Diabetes, D-Life, Diabetes Daily, these are just examples of sites where people are sharing real stories. And also, they are found on Twitter, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But Twitter has become a repository for people who are looking to connect with others and might not want to commit to writing a blog or might, want not, might, might not want to dedicate time to a forum. They can share their life in snippets through the Twitter sphere. So part of the power of connecting with my peers online, you know, digitally and getting to know other people who had malfunctioning pancreases was because those connections helped me further the true goals I had in my life. My life goal was not to connect with other people with diabetes. My life goals were slightly more generic. I mean, quite simply, I wanted to be a mother and connecting with other people who had done this before me helped, helped me aspire to and actually gain traction on that goal. And it was a really difficult sort of journey at first because a person with diabetes and that accompanying pregnancy, it's always veiled as this kind of pregnancy. And I didn't want the steel magnolias kind of pregnancy. And for anyone listening to this uh, webinar, I'm going to do some spoiler alerts for the movie Steel Magnolia. So if you haven't seen it and it's something you really want to see, just put your fingers in your ears for a minute. But one of the lead characters, the Julia Roberts character named Shelby, has type 1 diabetes. And this was an exciting development to me as a kid because it was diabetes. In the movie, psychosocially, I felt, wow, this is, this is real life and in the media. So I watched it with my mom. But the problem is, is that the girl with diabetes, she gets married and she gets pregnant and she has a baby. But then, but then she dies. And this is not the view of a pregnancy with type 1 that I was looking for. I didn't feel inspired by this. I felt terrified by this. This was showing me that this was something I couldn't do. I couldn't be a mom. I couldn't be healthy. I wanted this pregnancy with diabetes. I wanted, you know, you look at the slide and you think this bear clearly didn't get into that horse <laughs> riding arrangement very simply. It probably took a lot of hard work and it probably took some effort, maybe some help from their trainers or whatever. But once they got on there, the ride was great and the bear is having fun. That was the image of a diabetic pregnancy that I was willing to subscribe to. So after so much hard work and so much crowdsourced information through my peers using Twitter and blogs and forums and just plain old email, I felt confident taking the steps towards motherhood. And my husband and I were thrilled to see a positive pregnancy test and so began my personal journey with a diabetic pregnancy. And during the course of that journey, peer-to-peer -peer support was crucial. Without it, I wouldn't have ever gained access to what has been dubbed the Kevin spreadsheet, which is a blood sugar logging spreadsheet that one of the members of the diabetes online community created and one that I used religiously during my pregnancy to track the all-important blood sugar numbers. And I also relied on the community to help me work through things like the first trimester low blood sugars that plagued me and that plagued so many others with type 1 diabetes. These low blood sugars, these hypoglycemic events were symptom free often and very scary. And even though my, oops, sorry, and even though my peers couldn't treat the low itself, they did help treat the fear that came along with those lows. So even something as simple as where can I put my infusion set was a question answered by my peers who had been there before me. It felt weird sharing the intimate moments of a chronicled pregnancy online, but there was power to it because I had a lot of people saying, me too, we're offering their insight. Again, not medical advice, but just, and not even commiseration because that makes it sound miserable, more the I've been there, I've done it, and you can do this too. And that was so powerful, which helped me gain the actual result that I was looking for, which was a healthy baby. And she's a baby who doesn't have diabetes, but she still lives with diabetes because she lives with her mother's diabetes. She became part of my support network uh, was the day she was born. And even now she's barely four years old, but she still has a very concrete um, knowledge base about low blood sugars and high blood sugars and what a pump is. I actually think her fourth word was pump. But the point is more, her life wouldn't exist if I didn't feel empowered to pursue pregnancy and motherhood. And that's something I credit very strongly to my peers in the diabetes online community. We teach one another to live with diabetes. And the peer-to-peer -peer support that we are engaging in helps take care of the whole person who is living with a chronic illness. 
Now, when I think about what I talk about with my doctors, um, my endocrinologist and I, we review blood sugars and we isolate blood sugar trends. And we tweak basal rates and insulin to carb ratios and we talk about the new technologies and what might work or not work for me. And then we even discuss my future plans. Am I planning a big trip? Probably. A new baby? Maybe. Training for a marathon? Probably not. But still, it's something I could discuss with her. We talk about exercise. We talk about determining what prescriptions need renewing. But it's with the diabetes community. I talk about how to implement these changes into my life. My doctor is fantastic and one of the leading endocrinologists in, in the country, but she can prescribe a pump and I might not use it. It's when my peers show me how to wear it and how to avoid being frustrated by it. That's when I really take what my healthcare provider is telling me and what my peers are telling me and I help make really smart, educated, healthy choices for my life. We teach one another as people with diabetes and chronic illness communities as a whole how to live with diabetes, how to hack it to fit into our lives. So for example, people with diabetes are prescribed that continuous glucose monitor and that monitor vibrates when blood sugars are out of range. But sometimes in the middle of the night, if your blood sugar is low, you might not hear the alarm go off. And what good is an alarm that you're hearing and that you're not hearing? So people in the diabetes are showing one another how you can amplify the sound of that alarm simply by putting that receiver in a glass on your bedside table at night. And it might sound so simple and so trite, but it's so powerful because we're showing one another how to use these devices, how to implement them into our lives in a way that actually works. To that same end, there are people who have found uh, adhesive reactions to some of the devices that they're using. And people are using uh, different kinds of band-aids and skin barriers in efforts to avoid skin reactions so that they can continue to use the device. And even on a more like, oh, that's cute sort of level, um, people are showing one another how to wear devices and not where to put it on your body, but how to integrate it into your outfit. And this is a photo of my insulin pump hidden in my wedding dress, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're planning your big day, the last thing you want is to compromise the diabetes care that you work so hard to maintain. And so just something as simple as creating a pocket in my wedding dress to hold my insulin pump so that I could remain on it for one of the most important days of my life, that was powerful. And people in the diabetes community are sharing these sorts of of life hacks and, and inspirational things with one another so that they can live well with diabetes. People with diabetes in the community are also not just sharing anecdotal sort of stuff, but they're sharing reviews of products that they're using. And this slide is just an example of some people who are anecdotally reviewing devices that are either prescribed or that they're using um, without prescriptions uh, to manage their condition. And there's something about getting information and feedback from your peers. It is different from what you read on you know, med device websites or big pharma websites, you're getting the real version of device integration and medical integration into your life. I think that it looks nice on the website, but I turn to blogs and forums and Twitter to find out what it's really like. What's the truth behind these company claims? And the diabetes online community is so powerful in helping one another actually get to the truth. So the community is not just rooted in, you know, reviewing devices or talking about the, the, psychosocial support of life with diabetes, we're reaching outside of our bubble of privilege to help the diabetes community as a whole. And, and I think that this is such a powerful step for the diabetes online community because we're not just taking care of ourselves, but we're trying to take care of those who are unable to provide for themselves. And one initiative that the diabetes community undertook in February was called the Spare a Rose, Save a Child campaign. And the basic root of it is that on Valentine's Day, instead of sending a dozen roses to your loved one, you're supposed to send 11 and save the value of that one saved rose and donate it to the insulin, uh, the International Diabetes Foundation's Insulin for Life program. And they provide supplies, education, and resources, and insulin for kids in developing countries who don't have access. And so in 2013, the Sparrow Rose campaign raised almost $3,000. And this past year, in 2014, we raised almost $30 thousand dollars and that is not a trivial figure there were 834 individual donations that came from 24 different countries and they all were coming together to support people in the diabetes community that we don't even will never have the opportunity to say uh, hello to these people or to shake their hands but we're actually able to impact their lives through coming together to support them those donations actually provided a year of life for 454 children in developing countries that is an extremely powerful number, more powerful than any A1C that I will ever have. And this is just a little, a uh, little more data information on, you know, the outreach that the community achieved. We had 100, uh, 1,339 tweets, 50 blog posts, two television interviews, one magazine article. But these numbers aren't what really matters. What matters is that figure of almost thirty thousand dollars raised by small 
small donations that ended up having a huge, huge impact. So we take care of those outside of our bubble. And then we also take care of one another physically and emotionally. These, these uh, organizations on this slide are examples of communities and websites that inspire people not to sit around with their diabetes, but to exercise their right to exercise. So if you're insulin dependent and you are um, nervous about low blood sugar, sometimes the idea of exercise can be really intimidating because hypoglycemic episodes are often feared by people living with diabetes and it can be an impediment to getting you out there and moving. Well, how do I exercise if I just took an insulin dose? And what happens if I go low? What do I do? What do I do? How do I live with this condition? And organizations like Connected in Motion, Insulin Dependence, Riding on Insulin, Living Vertical, these these organizations are showing you that yes, you can live with type 1 diabetes, but you can also explore with it. And you can do marathons with it, and you can go on canoe trips with it. There's nothing that you cannot do with type 1 diabetes, and people in these groups will show you just how you can achieve your goals. It's pretty cool stuff. And I like, I like to show this slide because uh, this is Sebastian Sasseville, and I think he's pretty cool because currently he is running across Canada. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2002, and in 2008, he became the first Canadian with type 1 to reach the summit of Mount Everest. That's crazy all on its own. But several years later, uh, Seb competed in the mythical Sahara race in Egypt, a 250-kilometer self-supported ultra marathon. So he's run across the Sahara, and he's gone up Everest. And now, currently, right now, he is running across Canada. It's a 7,500-kilometer solo run across Canada from St. John's to Vancouver, He's doing 180 marathons in nine months. So just kind of think about that for a second. So this guy is living with type 1 diabetes, just like I am, and he is running 180 marathons over the course of nine months. And sometimes when I am reluctant to test my blood sugar in the morning or if I'm feeling a little down about Hey, Carrie, um, I think we lost you. In my head, um, we can't hear you. You sound, um, way I think people like. For all of our participants, if you don't mind hanging on the line, um, diabetes can stop you. Few minutes. I think if you can run across Canada, we'll see if we can get Carrie um, back on. Are we back? Oh, yep. There you go. I, sorry, I think I disappeared for a minute. Did you hear me talk about the big blue test, or can I jump into that? No, please jump in there. Okay, sorry about that. So you still have my slides up? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so just we'll pretend that glitch didn't happen and move on, right? This is life with diabetes and technology. It doesn't always work perfectly. <laughs> but um, to that same end, so this slide here is an example, another example of uh, inspiration found through exercise. So this is an initiative, the Big Blue Test, which is hosted by the Diabetes Hands Foundation, which is run by people living with diabetes. And the point of it is to show people the impact that exercise can have on their blood sugars. And last year, in 2013, they, as you can see, analyzed over 20,000 entries to show people that exercising simply for 14 to 20 minutes can have an average drop of 22 milligrams per deciliter in their blood glucose results. So that's a lot of, you know, chatter just to say that diabetes can be positively impacted by exercise. And people in the diabetes online community are crowdsourcing information to show people that if you think that exercising isn't worth your time, this proves to you that it is. You can manage your blood sugars and contribute to your overall better health by exercising, even just for 14 minutes a day. Again, there's so much power found in this sort of anecdotal evidence. So now this is a nice silly slide, which I really love, but um, this is an illustration done by Kim Vlasnik, uh, and it was for what the diabetes community um, has dubbed the diabetes terms of endearment. And that's the jargon that people with diabetes are using uh, when they talk about their diabetes. So it might not be a term that you use when you talk to your doctor, but are, they're terms that are being used by people within the community to kind of support one another, and it's a secret language between people with diabetes. And kind of having that secret handshake, that secret language, does a lot to have people feel empowered. So, for example, uh, one of the terms of endearment um, would be to rage bolus. 
And to rage bolus is loosely defined as if your blood sugar is high and it's not responding to the insulin injections or the doses that you're giving, you sometimes take a larger than normal dose because you're so frustrated. It's rooted out of, out of anger and frustration called a rage bolus. Even if it's not a larger than normal dose, even just a little dose that's rooted in, oh, I'm so frustrated. That's a rage bolus. Uh, similarly, if you're a woman wearing an insulin pump and you decide to tuck that insulin pump into the front of your undergarments, that's sometimes called uh, disco boobs. And these might be terms that people outside of the diabetes community chuckle at or need to explain to them. But within the diabetes community, you hear these things and you think, yes, this makes sense. This makes me feel like I'm less alone. This makes me feel like I am empowered to take better care of my diabetes, knowing that there's a community that supports me. Sorry, I said boobs on your webcast. So coming uh, back to kind of the judgment that comes with life with diabetes and how the diabetes online community and the community as a, as a whole helps contribute to pulling down those walls is that blood sugars are often viewed as grades for people with diabetes. They're viewed as, as little data points that determine our self-worth, which is so untrue. It's just data, it's just information. And I feel like the diabetes community helps teach one another that a blood sugar that's in range isn't necessarily an A+, plus. it's just a blood sugar that's in range. Just as a blood sugar that's out of range doesn't mean that you failed. It means that you have a data point that's out of range and you have the tools that you need to correct it back into range. Kind of viewing these blood sugars in a way that doesn't make you feel as though you're, like I said, your worth as a person is tied to your blood sugar results, makes it easier to continue to test your blood sugar, makes it easier to continue to go to the doctor because you don't fear the results that you're getting so much as you're looking for a way to help improve those results. So some of the ways that people in the diabetes community are providing that kind of reality check and peer-to-peer -peer support with one another, they come through so many different venues, but one really important one is happening on Twitter. And it's called DSMA, the hashtag is DSMA, and it's the Diabetes Social Media Advocacy Chat that takes place on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And it's not a bunch of people getting together through Twitter to give medical advice. It's a bunch of people living with diabetes and who are caring for people with diabetes coming together to anecdotally support one another. Uh, the questions can range from how do you view your diabetes to what's the best thing diabetes wise that happened to you this week or what's the worst thing that happened to you and dozens to hundreds of people come together during the same hour on Wednesday nights and talk about these things. So if you're living in a rural area and you can't find anyone else who's living with diabetes, you can actually go onto the web and find people who are real time discussing the things that impact your life. There's empowerment to this. To that same end, there's a project, again, by Kim Vlasnik called the You Can Do This Project, which is based off of the It Gets Better video project, only this one is diabetes-centric. And the purpose is to show people that diabetes is something that they can do and something that they can live well with. Now, there's so much power to this project in particular because it's a video project. So you get to see people like you and see their faces and hear their voices and know that you're not alone and not just read their words. Reading words is fantastic, but sometimes just seeing someone look into the camera and say, this is something that you can do and I also struggle with it, but together we can do this. I don't know, the, the power that's, that's gleaned from a project like Kim's is, is tremendous and can't be underestimated by healthcare professionals. This is where people with diabetes are going at times to fill in that gap of, needing help. Another example of, of a similar sort of project is called My Diabetes Secret, which is a website, a Tumblr account created by Christopher Snyder, um, where people with diabetes can anonymously submit concerns, thoughts, feelings, whatever that they have about life with diabetes. And again, it might seem like something that healthcare professionals and even people living without diabetes might look at and say, why would you need to do that? Why do you need to get this information off your chest. Why do people with diabetes need to make these connections? And it's because if you read this slide, there are some pretty heavy things on this slide. And being able to say these things out loud and being able to get this off your chest, so to speak, it lightens the burden of life with diabetes. And that's not like a pity party. Everyone should feel bad for people with diabetes. It's more even the best lived life with diabetes does come with some hiccups that are emotional. And being able to share those and know that you're not alone in thinking those things can be a really powerful step towards taking better care of yourself. So one last thing that I definitely want to highlight is um, it's not just happening online. These things are happening offline. And this bracelet is an example of a fantastic offline meeting called the Friends for Life Conference, which takes place in Orlando in July every year, or it has since 1995. And it's run by the Children with Diabetes Organization. And this, this conference brings together families touched by diabetes, 
not so that they can get together and gripe so much as they can get together and know that they're not alone. Now, the first time I went to this conference was in 2008, and it was like diabetes camp for adults, that feeling of camaraderie and support and peer-to-peer -peer support that I felt going to Clara Barton camp as a child. I felt this at the Friends for Life conference, which is brought by, by children with diabetes. It's very powerful. So I like this slide because it kind of shows that the proof is in the sugar-free, albeit pudding. People with diabetes have better health, health outcomes when they are supported, when they feel like they're not alone. Like I said, you can have the best tools, but if you're not using them or if you don't feel empowered to use them or educated enough to use them, they just sit in a drawer, you know, unused. The point of people coming together online, it's not to enable one another. It's not, you know, so people can get on there and say on Twitter, oh, my blood sugar is 200, and then everybody logs on and says, oh, that's great. Oh, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. It's more we're empowering one another to be honest with the results that we're getting and to help inspire one another to achieve more in-range results, better results, even feel better about making the effort to test again. It's not enablement. It's empowerment. So the diabetes online community, it's not replacing medical advice, but it's reinforcing it. Not only that, but it provides a source of support and that you're not alone for people with diabetes and their caregivers. And that's something that they might really be looking for. My reasons for sharing my story with life, of life with type 1 diabetes were kind of few, but very definitive. I felt alone and I wanted to feel less alone because that whole feeling alone thing was wreaking havoc on some of my emotional health. I didn't have many peers in my life, like I said, who were living with diabetes. And the internet back in 2005 offered little in terms of support. I needed a community to make me feel whole. And so you can have the best access to all the best doctors and all the best technologies, but it's all garbage unless you're in the right headspace to make proper use of it. And peer-to-peer -peer support offers the hope that people with diabetes need to manage this disease. And that hope stands in stark contrast to the fear that we're often fed as a patient community. Fear is not the best motivator for someone uh, like me. And from what I've heard, it's not a good motivator really for anyone. Hope is a far more effective motivational source. I hope to be healthy for a very long time. And it's hope that keeps me testing my blood sugar every morning and working with my doctor to best manage my diabetes and monitoring this disease as closely and effectively as I can. I, it's not the images of amputation flashing in front of my eyes that I want every time I grab a meter. It's the hope of living a long and healthy life that motivates me to take control of my health. And I, I find that hope rooted deeply in peer-to-peer -peer connections and I'm grateful for it. So health outcomes are improved for people who are connected with their peers, and I'm just hopeful that this, uh, this slide deck kind of helped illustrate that point for everyone. And at this point, I'd like to open up to questions if there, if there are any. Otherwise, Emma and I will have to chat, and who knows what we'll ask one another. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Am I back? Yep, you're back. And then I'm going to pull up uh, my slides to remind everyone how um, to submit questions to us. Okay, so um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So you can either raise your hand or you can um, type your question into the little chat section. So our first question is about um, some of your personal experiences, Carrie, and it's, it's that, do you still talk to any of those in the 1989 Clara Barton class? Oh, that's where the internet has become even more magical because when I was at camp, Facebook didn't exist. But since joining Facebook maybe eight or nine years ago, I found the kids that I went to camp with only were now all adults and connecting, you know, through that venue. So it, it's really cool. I, I wasn't able to seek them out then. I mean, back in the day, we used to write each other you know, letters and snail mail and that sort of thing, which was lovely, but not as immediate. Uh, but now, I mean, I can Facebook message any of my old camp friends. And I think that's really cool because I get to see that they are alive and well and, and thriving. I love that. Okay, and our um, next question is, where would be the best place for a newcomer to start engaging with the diabetes community? Um, reading blogs, reading blog posts, Twitters, all of the above? I, to be perfectly honest, I think it depends on, on the person and the age of diagnosis. If you're an adult diagnosed with diabetes, you know, as an adult, jumping into things like 
forums and um, blogs and that sort of thing seems effective because you're you have the wherewithal to process that kind of um, information. But I think for the parents of newly diagnosed children with diabetes, it can be a little tricky because that information overload can almost do more harm than good in the beginning. I really think it's important when people are first diagnosed that they talk to their doctors and they get their information from their doctors because the internet is all well and good and it's great for support but it's also known for kind of shilling snake oil and giving misinformation at times. And I would hate for a newly diagnosed person with diabetes to interact with misinformation versus accurate information. So rooting diabetes education in your doctor's you know, office, I think is the best way to start. And then kind of branching out you know, from there. Uh, for parents of kids with diabetes, I think that the Children with Diabetes website is fantastic. For adults with diabetes, I think that Two Diabetes is a really good community to join uh, in addition to reading individual blogs. It's just there's kind of something for everybody, which I think speaks to the vastness of the diabetes community. I mean, if this person has a specific um, situation that they're looking to find information on, I, I, I can try to offer a resource. But just in general, talk to your doctor first, get comfortable with the medical information, and then seek the support once you feel equipped to at least take your insulin and test your blood sugar. Great. Um, and Definitely. for the person who asked that question, he included his um, Twitter handle. So okay. if, if you want me um, to say that, please just kind of indicate that in the question. I don't know if, if you wanted me to read that out loud to all the folks. Um, so related to that question, um, as a clinician, what would you recommend um, to clinical providers in engaging their patients in online communities? I, you know, if there's, if this, this question is from a clinical provider, is this from you, Emma? A uh, both. Okay. Um, if there is a, a healthcare professional who is engaging online with people with diabetes or chronic illness communities, I, I applaud them because I feel like the online community and people who are sharing anecdotal stories, they're putting disease into context. So when I sit in my doctor's office, she sees me for an hour or two in total over the course of a year. But if she's interacting and kind of getting a taste for what diabetes might be like outside of her office, that's very powerful. I mean, recently I, I wrote about... um the lies that we tell our, our doctors. Like if your endocrinologist sits you down and says, are you exercising every day? And you want to say yes. And so you lie and say yes. But in reality, you know, you're, you're not. It's sometimes we don't want to disappoint our healthcare professionals and actually tell them what we're not doing right and, and what we're having trouble with. We want them to be proud of us. It's a weird mental head game. But I think if doctors are, are at least lurking on sites where people with diabetes are talking openly about their experiences, they might have more of a flavor for what we might be bending the truth on. And they can really really help us. I, I can't say how important it is for my endocrinologist. Uh, her input in my life is, is tremendous, and I lean on her for all of my medical information. But it's nice to know when she knows that sometimes stress is what's causing high blood sugar and not that I ate the wrong thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Was it too early for finger quotes, or? Oh, um, no. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait a few more minutes to see if any more questions come in. Mm -hmm. Or is there anything that you um, wanted to share with us, Carrie, that you might have cut out from your original presentation um, to be within the time frame? Uh, <laughs> when I was when I was removing slides because I thought I had too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I feel like kind of what we just talked about the whole getting information from your doctor first is is something that I should have had a whole slide dedicated to and I'm remiss in having just bringing bringing it up now. Um, I think that there's a people with diabetes lean on one another very heavily for information and again I think that's very powerful and super effective but you have to be starting with a good foundation. I feel like that good information foundation does come from doctors and sometimes I get a little frustrated with doctors and patients alike who think they know more than the other. I mean I don't think that there's a doctor out there who knows more about my personal diabetes than me, because diabetes is very individualized, but I can't claim for a second to know more than my endocrinologist does on the whole. And there's a little bit of a dance and a balance that comes between those two camps because uh, no one wants to be viewed as wrong and also no one wants to be viewed as, as judged. But I do think that people with diabetes need to have a nice strong foundation of, of medically based information that they get from their doctors. And then they move into figuring out how to live with diabetes from their from their peers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so our next question is actually someone has raised their hand. Um, so Judy, I'm going to attempt to unmute you and you can um, ask your question directly. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Carrie, I really appreciated your perspective of steel magnolias, but uh, I know when I was diagnosed in the 60s, I lived through a real experience, and frankly, steel magnolias was a real story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I find it so fascinating how through the decades things have changed. And just like you, I was absolutely doing those clinitests, but the the pumps and all weren't available, nor was the uh, nor was the testing. But I re I really admire you. You're so articulate, and I just appreciate it. And um, actually, I saw you at uh, JDRF a couple years ago here in Las Vegas, and you just did a great job. And I just wanted to say thank you. You're very very inspiring, and I appreciate you. The JDRF in Las Vegas has such a good chapter. They're very active, and that was such a cool event. But it is important to note that the Steel Magnolia story is is true, and that. Those are experiences that people had. It was just more when I was looking to get pregnant, the realities had changed. When I was diagnosed, they said you shouldn't have children, and having children, you know, biologically will be very difficult for you. And and now when kids are diagnosed, they don't get that same spiel. I mean, we've come along in our treatment and our management of diabetes to the point where you can't have kids is not a phrase that's uttered to little girls who are diagnosed. Absolutely. I, I, mean, I mean, that's beautiful in and of itself because that's an awful thing to have taken from you when you when you're seven. As they say, it, you've come a long way, baby. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Um, and then our, our, we have another hand raised um, for, oh, nope, the hand just went down. Never mind. Oh, they got shy. <laughs> oh. I mean, it is lunchtime, so. It is getting close to lunch. <laughs> um, all right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, Carrie, is there anything else you want to add to close? I, I'm just glad that you guys had me on and that you're embracing the patient story because I'm not the voice of people with diabetes. It's not like the Lorax. Like, I'm one of many, many people who are sharing their stories. And I think hearing from different patient populations, from the patients themselves, really puts diseases into context. So I applaud you guys for kind of taking the leap of faith with me, and I hope to see you do it with other patient populations going forward. No pressure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. Um, to our participants, um, the webinar has re been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel um, within the next few days. So please share from there. And then we also have a short evaluation if you can take a minute or two to fill that out. Okay, thank you.